started, I know you have a very busy schedule. My name is uh, Srini Reddy, I'm a professor of marketing and I'm the director of the Center for Marketing Excellence. And we've been doing this for uh, how long, Human? For the last, uh, yeah, since she's been around, but I've, I've been here at SMU since nine, 2009. So it's almost 10 years that we've been doing it, nine plus years. Um, and so this is the inaugural one for this academic year. So it's such a pleasure to actually have Samir. Samir Gupta from uh, DBS come in and talk about a very hot topic. I mean, because everybody is talking about analytics these days, and he's the head of uh, analytics at DBS. There are interesting, interesting problems that, uh, that, that every firm faces, and nothing less in financial sector. Because they deal with huge amounts of customers and huge amounts of data that actually gets collected. So it's always interesting and fascinating to hear what each of these industries do. And so we are so lucky to have Samir come and talk to us today. Yeah. So let me give you a brief introduction of what Samir uh, comes from. So obviously he's, he's currently at DBS. He's been here at, at DBS for four years. Prior to that, he worked for G Capital for another four in Singapore. Uh, prior to that, he was with G Capital in England yeah, for about eight years, is what I was told. Right? Yeah. So he, he graduated from Delhi University with an economics degree and an MBA from IIMC, Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, which is usually the one they consider to be more analytical. The several IIMs now, but the top three were IIM Ahmedabad and Calcutta and Bangalore. Now, I think C is always, yeah, they have the little bit of an edge in terms of being more technical and quantitative. So anyway, so I think whatever uh, he did at GE and DBS, they picked the right ones uh, here, okay? But, uh, so this is this is what I, I just want to set up. As, set up a stage, yeah. So he's been here in, uh, in, in, in Singapore for 10 years, and uh, he's, he's here with his wife and two uh, children, two boys, I think, yeah. and, and so anyway, so the rest of the stuff you already know, right? Because I've given you, I didn't want to repeat all of this stuff, but I want to give a little bit of a personal touch to the introduction. My apologies, I typically would be staying and sort of wrapping up the session and asking for questions and so on, but unfortunately, I'm, I'm doing another program for a company called Internet Class, so it's one flight up. So I took a break and then came down to meet up with Samir and introduce. But my colleague uh, is here, uh, Professor Abulia. Yeah, She recently joined us from Emory University. Yeah, And she will be the one who will wrap up the session and, uh, uh, at the end, end of it. OK? Yeah. Sa Samir, it's such a pleasure to see you. Okay? Thank no, you. I, I will actually meet up with you. Yeah, all. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, so thank you, and it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, so what we'll do, we have one and a half hours, right? So what we'll do is I will talk for probably 50 minutes, and then we'll open up. And I want it to be more about questions and inquiry. What, what's in your mind? You know, the, the purpose I'm spending the time here is to get a sense as to what are the questions you have, and it could be anything related to analytics, related to banking, related to career. Anything goes in this in these walls and we'll get a straight answer from me. Um, so that's what we want to do, right? So the topic that we kind of worked on is DBS has been really focused on competing in this new digital space. So I don't know if a few weeks back, we, a few months back we were uh, recognized for the second year the world's best digital bank by Euromax. Just two days ago we've been recognized as world's best bank by Global Finance. And in both of them, the key to that recognition has been really about our digital transformation that DBS has been driving, and not just to the front end, but across all aspects of DBS. And that's what I want to share. I want to share about how we are thinking of leveraging data and analytics. And I'll go deeper on analytics, but think about it between analytics and digital on across such a wide variety of topics and wide variety of issues. So that's what I want to kind of share and talk about. Again, I, I'm sure you guys have, you, you talk about this all the time, right? Uh, the Alibabas, the Tencent, they will rule the world. Everything else will become a platform and kind of become a dump pipe. Uh, and cost and efficiency. So if I give you a story. We've been in India as DBS bank in the retail bank for the last 15 years. And we in the last 15 years, we've been we've been allowed to set up one branch every year. So we ended up with 13 branches. And in those 13 branches, through acquisitions, we have acquired, we had acquired around 20,000 customers. So imagine if India is 1.3 billion people, 
even if you want to get to 5 million customers, how many branches and how many years would it take? Right? Of course, you know, more than my lifetime. That's where we, we looked at our digital strategy. So we launched a digital only bank in India. This was two years ago. The idea was the customer did not need to go into the bank to open your account. This was the first time ever globally that this was done. So all KYC, which is know your customer, all other things were leveraging the India stack, which is Aadhaar card, where biometrics are, to do that. And we launched that. In, in the 18 months to 20 months till now, we have already acquired 2 million customers. Our goal is in the next 12 months to get it up to 5 million customers. So just the whole, that's what the fintechs of the world are doing, right? They are able to leverage scale and get cost and efficiency and do it. So as a bank, how do we think differently to get the same? And that's where, so we, we were very successful in India. We have now launched it in Indonesia last, just uh, beginning of this year. We are now launching it in Taiwan, which is really bringing all of this so that we are not tethered by having a branch to really grow our business and grow our interaction with us. And all young people, nobody walks into the branch anymore. Everyone wants to do everything on the mobile, right? You're on the go. Everything's on the mobile, so why not banking on the mobile? And that's what I'm going so our, our digital model is really three key things on top, really. Acquire, so how do we acquire new customers? How do we transact? How do we make it transaction? So a lot in the past, a lot of banks would they do is, okay, you can apply online, but then somebody will take a printout of the form, run it through paper process and all of that. So for us, it's really end-to-end -end digitization. End-to-end, -end, no paper, no human touch. That's what we are striving for. Uh, and then engage. How do we keep constantly engaged with the customers? And you know, banking, it's difficult to constantly engage. When you are on Instagram and Facebook, you are always engaged. WhatsApp, you're always, you look at it 10 times an hour. But banking, nobody needs to look at it 10 times an hour or even on a daily basis. So how do, how do we kind of bring engagement to our customers and make it meaningful for them? So that's really part of the engagement piece. And the bedrock of all this is, you know, working with partners and really there is no winning in the digital space without data you look at all all the platform companies which are very successful everyone is built on a base of analytics google is built on analytics facebook is successful for the analytics that it runs on so that's what we are and that's where we are scaling up is really that for us to be successful in the digital world you have to be analytics and big data has to really be driving it. So really three key things are around our transformation. So first I talked about digital to the core. And that's one big difference with a lot of other banks versus DDS. We are not just doing lipstick on a paper, which is, you know, do a fancy app, but everything else is very manual at the back end. We are looking at it end to end across all internal and external products. Embed ourselves in the customer journey, and I'll go through a bit more detail, but we have to know what, nobody wakes up to do banking. How do we kind of think of it differently and really how do we do it differently? I'll share our concept of thinking around it. And then we are a 22,000, 50 year old company, a bank, right? How do we start thinking or how do we get each and every person in DBS to think like a startup? Take ownership like a startup. Take risks like a startup. Obviously, don't take risks that blow up the bank, but have the courage to do stuff rather than say, oh, I'm waiting for somebody to tell me what to do. And that's kind of the whole scenario that we need to keep pushing. DBS has been successful, Singapore has been very successful because we've had the discipline. How do we marry the discipline with an innovative spirit and bring both the best out of both to really advance into the next 50 years? Uh, again, I won't go through this stuff into, but really the digital to the core is really end-to-end -end digital design for no ops, being very microservices, paperless, agile driven. So when you think of a bank which has been built over 50 years, we have close to 800 applications. A lot of them are monolithic, which are, you know, so changing them and transferring them, it's a significant transformation and a significant investment to move into the new. And if you were to start up new, you would start up very differently. But to transform, that's where it's a lot more challenging to do it. And that's one of the big parts of what we have been doing. 
This is an important element. So if you think of what the customer is, customer is trying to do things, right? On the right side is really customers is talking about my utilities, my entertainment, day-to-day -day activity that they want to do, where each of us want to do. On the other side is things that we're thinking about, retirement, my pension, my investment, my mortgage, which are activities that we would do not day-to-day, -day, but broader that we would do around where finance or money comes in. Banking is a subset, is, is to support all these activities that we do. Nobody does banking for the sake of banking. People do banking because they want to do all these other activities and it helps facilitate that. And my way is really, as consumers, some people might want to still go to the branch, great, you can do that. Some people might want to do it on the net, some people might want to do it on mobile, some other ways would want to do it on the net. So how do we offer that flexibility and make sure that, so this is kind of our, one of our mantras inside internally, making banking visible, the invisible, so that you don't even know that you're doing banking because it's all embedded in what you or each individual wants to do. For us, the startup culture, one is a customer obsession. How do we, how are we <coughs> obsessed about customers? Banks traditionally have been obsessed about banking stuff and processes. You know? And it's still, so it's a big culture shift to get each and every one to really think what does the customer want and how does that happen. Um, data driven, take risks and experiment. Very critical part. I mean, the idea of being a data led experimentation factory is what we want to get to. That's what is successful. Amazon tests a lot of algorithms on a daily basis and uses data to say which ones go into production and which ones customers. Banks traditionally will say, oh, let me, before I test, let me make sure it won't fail. And because of this nature of that, I don't want to have anything that won't fail, we are very conservative in what we will try. So how do we kind of get to a balance between innovation and managing risk? Agile, working smartly, soft with people in a smaller team rather than with you know, you know, very waterfall that we have committees and stuff which kind of works too. And then learning organization, how do we, this is actually one of the most important things. You guys in your careers as you do, will have to pivot and learn at least three to four times. In my career when I started off, I, I started off in marketing, I did sales, I moved to risk, now I am uh, running analytics. But in each stage, I had to upgrade my skills, upgrade myself. And to me, I've been lucky, uh, it's, it's happened twice. But I think this is the one thing that will be the big differentiator in your careers. Because there's not going to be any set career which says, you know what, I'm going to go into banking and I will retire from banking in 30 years. You will have to reinvent yourself, you'll have to learn. So the ability to learn, in my mind, is the biggest differentiator for each individual. The ability to really get that on and self-ability to learn. Don't learn because somebody is forcing you to learn. Be ahead of the curve. And that's again something that we want to institutionalize within DPS, within each and every. So this, I want to take, what I'll do is I'll just run through what does customer obsession mean and how do we think about this? just to give a context to it and then I'll go into some examples of data driven and some things that we're doing. So this is a drill, right? Electric drill. In Singapore, uh, we don't do the drilling ourselves. We probably hire someone to do the drilling. But, but if you think from a US concept, uh, where most of the people do a DIY yourself, a drill, purchase of a drill is a very important decision. So the drill makers focus a lot on how do I make the drill light? How do I make the drill, you know, the whole thing much better, it doesn't break, all of these options that they will focus on. So what are they thinking of? How can I get the perfect hole for the customer? That's what the drill does, right? It just does, drills a hole in the wall or whatever you want to do. But if you think from a customer standpoint, what does the customer want? Is the hole the output that they want or the outcome they want? Actually, no. I mean, in this case, you want the hole so that you can find pictures, right? So, so being a drill company, if I'm only focused on the hole, I will miss out on all of these other competitors coming in, which will say, you can put up your pictures without drilling in the wall. 
that's where innovation in, comes in, right? So if you think very narrowly, so this is really one of the fundamentals. You have to think about what is the job that the customer wants to do. The job is not the whole. The job is to hang up memories. And there are many ways that that job can be done. But we as banking have to think about that and think. So that's where, that's the basis of our customer obsession and are trying to get people to think, our own employees to think differently. Think about the job to be done. And why I relate this story is, all of you will do projects, will go in and do work. Always look at what is, look at what is the outcome. What is, if you have a customer or a stakeholder, what is the real job that they need to get done? Because the better you understand it, the better you will be able to work and make sure you are helping deliver that. Because a lot of times we do work, but it's not helping the job to be done. So the better we understand the job to be done, the more focused we'll be and more uh, successful we'll be. Same. How many of you woke up this morning and said, yeah, I have a payment to do or I want to do banking? Said, oh, fantastic. <laughs> what a great day. Nobody? Really? <laughs> Come on, somebody. But nobody does that, right? I mean, well, what we do is, I have school fees to pay. So therefore, school fees is my job to be done, not payment. Right? So that's the difference between, you know, job to be done and how. But bankers traditionally would have said, oh, payment, payment, payment. No, customers don't care about the payment. Customer cares about paying the school fees. So therefore, think broader. Think about the job to be done. So taking this whole thing, and this is an example of, and I want to share one, one among the many examples of how DBS is thinking of this different thing. So mortgage is a very important part of our customer base, right? Mortgage is when you buy a house. When you buy a house, you put a small down payment. Rest of it, you take a loan and you do it. But it's a, it's a very, very involved decision. And it's a very important asset class from banking perspective. Right? But typically, if you look at the mortgage process, the banking process is really a small subset. The biggest thing you do is, where should I move? Should I buy in East Coast? Should I buy in West Coast? What are the schools that are around? Where do my friends stay? Where do my family stay? Uh, what is the what kind of people stay? What kind of food makan is there? All of that is a critical, important decision, and it it takes a long time to understand that and right, come up and make that decision. But banks traditionally only reach out and work with you when you've already made a decision. Whereas a lot of times the search compare is the longer process, and how can we help our customers in that process? Because we have tons of data. So what we did was we we launched this app, which is a Home Connect app, where we brought in a lot of data that we had existing. So data that we had on rentals, data that we had on purchase of properties and prices, data that we had on schools which are around, which we didn't have, but we plugged into government databases and other things and built all of that together. So data that we had on ATMs which are available, on markets which are available. So you can look at a condo or a HDB and say, this is what it is, and it can give you a broader picture of what is around you. What are the prices that have happened? What are the rentals that are there? What schools are around you? All of that. So what we are trying to do is really trying to get to the job to be done. Help customers with the job to be done. And we, we, it's not all altruistic in our part, right? If we are engaged with you upfront in the process, when it comes to a mortgage decision, we will be in the consideration set. If you are not, then it will be a price thing. So that's that's what we want to change in terms of this whole customer obsession. And that's how, even for all our analytics projects, that's how we're focusing. And really focused on what is the job to be done, and therefore, where does analytics help in that process? So just uh, in DBS, over the last uh, 12 months, we've launched this whole, or something called the Data First Program, which is, so we've been doing analytics for the last uh, quite many years, but now we have put a big transformation program uh, around it, which is really focused on maximizing value from data. And really, it's really focused on, not that we have the cleanest data or the best data. No, how do we derive value from data? Three big legs. The first one is culture. 
culture is very critical because if each and every person starts to think about data first in the decision they make on a daily basis, you will make a better decision than what you did earlier. So how do we change that? Enable in a bank typically over the past few years, we've always had a lockdown view of data. Data was not available, it was locked up because of risk and protection and regulation. How can we balance the lockdown with access? Giving people the right access at the right time. Uh, platform, uh, and typically our banking platform, we, we have invested in data warehouses, but they've been traditional warehouses, more RDBMS kind of warehouses. Now as we look at a lot of non-traditional data coming in, huh? so that's one last pillar is really about building the fit for purpose platform. And again, a lot of transformation to get there. So that these are three big pillars that we have. It's a multi-year program uh, <coughs> called the Data First program focused on these three areas. So I'm going to focus now really around value from data. Right? And, and that's going to be my big uh, view. And the way to think about it is really value from data, not so much, but really all of it goes into our digital. So data and digital are kind of interlinked and how do we think about this together. So for, for almost our analytics and digital areas that we focus, so we are looking at three big areas. Innovate our products and services. How can we make it better for our customers? Whether it's a product, it's a service, whether it's about predicting where you would be, whether it's helping you predict what could go wrong so that we, we can go out and prevent that from happening. Customer experience, differentiate the customer. How, does, how do you, if it took you four minutes to reach somewhere in the digital lab, can we do it in four seconds? Can we do it faster? How can we do that? That's something we obsess about. And it's it's a constant journey. Have, have we reached that for everything that we do? No. But that's what we want to get to one by one. Change the way we work. So really focused on efficiency, productivity, all these aspects of making using data and digital to be more efficient in how we work. I mean, Facebook runs Facebook with 1.5 billion customers. With when it started off, or even till very recently, before the IPO, it was with 2,000 people. So the scale becomes totally different when you think about it. But you can only do it if you automate a lot of your processes. So that's kind of thinking around. So now what I do is, over the next uh, few slides, I'm just taking you through a few examples. And I've chosen these examples to be from a variety of areas. Uh, just to give you a sense of the variety that we work on. It's not just one area that we work on, but a variety of areas. So the first example is about calls. So I'm sure all of you, even in the digital world, have had problems which have made you call a call center or a helpline. Typically, it's probably the most painful process. Right? Here. First, you have to hold on, you have to wait, and then when somebody gets onto the phone, uh, half the time they're not able to resolve it. Half the time, you know, they tell you to do something else. So it's a for us a call to our call center is something has failed. Therefore, the customer's calling the call center. So how can we, if that's our mindset, how can we think of it differently? And that's where we get millions of calls. Millions of calls in Singapore a year. Okay. And we are looking to say, how can we really think about, how can we migrate to digital? Because most of the customers are digital customers of ours, but they are still not able to find the answer they're looking for, therefore they're calling us. So can we help them find the answer? How can we preempt that? How can we, a lot of times people will first go to a digital channel, not find what they're looking for easily, call. And then, how can we get even better and use analytics to do prediction? If Amazon can predict what is the next thing you're likely to buy, can we not predict that here is a likelihood of you to call using your transaction data, your behavior data, and saying that. So that's that's the holy grail for us. Predicting a call before it happens. Now, is that easy? Can we go this and do that? No, that's 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 where the smarts come in, right? And that's what the path is. So a lot of work is really happening around this place. So we are starting off with something called a personalized uh, FAQ which means that 
using all the individual's data that we have on what you transacted, which, which website within DBS you visited, what did you look at. When you go to a live, so we launched a live chat with a bot. When you go to a live chat, rather than showing a generic five questions, we show personalized five questions which are personalized for you. The goal is that, can we make it easy for you, rather than you typing it and saying, okay, this is what I'm looking for, up front, they say, here is what we think you're looking for, and get there. So, the concept is the same as the recommender, but it's really the usage of it in, in a banking scenario, with the view that, if we can solve the thing for the customer there, they don't need to call us. And the customer is happy because they get it resolved, and, and we are happy because we are we are able to save calls coming into calls. So we, this is a multi-year program that we have launched, and really our holy grail, like I said, is really uh, first step which we launched is personalized FAQs. Our holy grail that we are working on, and we launched a small pilot, is really the ability to predict. Calls. That's what we want to get to, and we will. It's still a very early pilot stage, but that's really our focus around this. Um, the other one, which is which is the marketing related, and I think this is a common example, right? How do we? Uh, and again, I'll give you. I've been an. I can share this in this room. I've been an Amex customer for like 25 years. Amex credit card customer globally. Wherever I've traveled, I've always had it. Now, I do a lot of spend on Amex, or I used to now, I don't because I do a DBS, but they should know where I spend, what do I spend on, right? Every day, because I don't switch off anything on PDPA or anything, I like to get what, what offers they send. For the longest time, when I moved to Singapore, the first few years in Singapore, for the longest time, every day I would get an email from Amex with an offer. And typically, the offer would be about staycation in Singapore. Offer would be about um, a restaurant which is way out. Now, if Amex had done even one bit of understanding the customer, they would know I have never done a staycation. My eating pattern is really around, I stay in the East Coast, and my eating pattern is really around one kilometer rate or two kilometer radius. And it's not so difficult. If you pan my transactions over one year, you can easily do that. But taking the effort to do it, and that's what we want to change is for us, how as DBS, we don't want to give these generic offers which mean nothing to anybody. How can we personalize what we want? Use the data to personalize, to make it more relevant. And really, it's about, you know, the whole big data around campaigns, what is relevant, take feedback, what works, what doesn't work, and really start the whole process with a lot of recommendation and modeling built into it. But it starts with the whole purpose of what are you trying to do? You are trying to make something, an offer or an interaction to the customer which is relevant for the customer. That's what you're trying to do. So how do you make sure that it's relevant? You can only make sure it's relevant by using, understanding the individual and using that understanding to make sure that your communication works for that individual. And now big data. In the old days, your sales team sitting across the face will ask you questions, will take a gauge, will know from your expression, are you interested, are you not interested in doing it. Now in the digital world, the only way to do this personalization or understanding is to be data. Anytime we have done this, and we see more, so from a business result standpoint, I know it's great for the consumer, but business result, it, it gives us more than three times lift in terms of outcomes that we get. So it's, it's very good for business results. This is something we've been trying to do. You know, Singaporeans love to travel, but different people have different travel habits. And for us, travel uh, gives us a lot of opportunity. First opportunity is probably a failure opportunity because a lot of times your if you go to Thailand and some other countries where chip car chip is not enabled, you have to enable the strap. And most of us keep it dis disabled. So when you go to a foreign country and then we use our chip and then our card gets rejected. So which is a terrible experience because then you have to call 
the bank in Singapore and try and do that and it becomes a so for us one of the things we want to solve is if we can predict when you are about to travel based on historic patterns or people like you then can we help you think about these things before you go and how do we do that so really it's a lot of you know data using your spend patterns people like you travel patterns, travel things that you do, bringing it all together to come up with predictions or understanding of when is the travel pattern, what kind of travel patterns you have. Humans are very habitual. You know, I always take a vacation in early July for two weeks and I always take a vacation in December. That's a given vacation. I might take one in April, I might take one or in October, but these two are a given. You know, if you think about it, Maybe early July might move by one week here or there. But, you know, and, and for 80% of the population, it's the same. So, how do we kind of, knowing this insight, make sure that we help them understand? And what does this help us do? We, we can send you, <clears throat> one, we help you make sure you don't get stuck where your card is not working in a foreign country. We can help. But we can also give you offers which are relevant for you, which then helps us earn revenue. So it's a win-win from both our sides. And what we find is even it's an early recommender, but in our top two designs here, we find a more than 40, you know, two times lift versus what we used to do earlier. So the signal data, and that's something we have to do all the time. We have to, it's not just use data and show. We have to show that data and analytics is leading to business impact. Because eventually that's what as a bank, that's what I'm measuring on this one. This is another interesting area. So, till now, a lot of this was really frontline failure. This is about attrition. So, we have large sales teams or relationship managers who manage our more wealthier customers. So, we have about 1,800 of them in Singapore. Very high turnover in that group. High is 18, 20 percent. One fifth of them churn every year. Anytime they churn, it takes them six months to get. Anytime we hire somebody, it takes them six months to get productive. So it's a big productivity loss. So one of the things we did, and this was an early experiment, we said, can we predict if somebody is about to leave? Using a lot of data around leave, around training, around meetings, around things which are not traditionally being used for that. And, but why do we want to do it? The whole idea of, and we, we found actually our model in the back testing was actually very, was quite accurate, 85% accuracy. Uh, what we are doing with this is, we are not going and telling the individual, oh, you are about to leave and this and that. <laughs> we, people leave an organization for two or three things, right? They, they feel disengaged. A lot of times it's about disengagement. So maybe it's about, and sometimes it's about they get a fantastic offer. You get a fantastic offer from outside, somebody offers you 60% greater salary, a greater board. You know, it's very difficult to counter. But 70-80% of people leaving is about disengagement. Here, what we do is, we give it to our HR managers and we give it to our senior leaders or managers to say, here is a person who is potentially disengaged. How can you engage that person more? Because there is a risk of it. And what we found is that, just by that engagement, there's been a significant drop in this target in this attrition. We were able to retain a lot of people. So, which is significant productivity. So that's really how, again, great example of doing something very different but using analytics in, in the HR space. Uh, credit scoring, so this is again, you know, when somebody applies for a loan, we do a credit scoring. Typically in Singapore, the easy thing is really, you go to the credit bureau, credit bureau has your record, you do it, great. But when you look at the big markets, China, Indonesia, India, credit bureau is very simple. Most of the people are not in credit. So how do we credit score them? And that's where we are working with a lot of our external partners, e-commerce players, telecom companies, and we've actually built, using data that's from our external partners, we've actually built models which are better predictors of credit behavior than the credit bureaus available in those countries. What does that give us? It gives us the ability to credit score people using our model, therefore give 
loans to the right customer and not to the wrong customer. That, that's what you're trying to do, right? You want to reduce losses, you give it to the right customer. Who will pay that? At least who has the intention to pay. And, and this is again significant in our growth strategy in markets beyond Singapore and Hong Kong. This is another interesting story. So this is this is about our digital chat. So our digital apps generate a lot of data, right? Every time you touch an app, it generates a data. It generates a data about which location you are in. It generates the data. If you do something, it probably does an API call to our back to our core systems, gets a response, and do that. So there's a lot of it. Also generates data when you go from one thing to the other in the app. So there's a lot of data being generated uh, around that. And when you do a transaction, it generates data. So one of the things we said in India, we launched this DigiBank. I was telling you about DigiBank in India. One of the things that we struggled with was in India, network is very sparse from time to time. You have lots of call drops and this and that. So our customers would get this quite a lot. Sorry, system. Now it could be due to network. It could be due to our. Our app, it could be, but from a customer standpoint, if it happens on our app, it's DBS's problem. So how do we get better and how do we preempt this? How do we predict it so we can tell the customer that it's going to happen? So that's what this goal is about. So how can we preempt it, right? So one of the things we did was we worked on a time series modeling and forecasting, which is really forecasting. So what this graph, which you can't see really well, is it's the next 24 hours forecast of when things will go wrong. If if that goes above these lines, then there's a problem. So it's focused. So basically, because things go wrong all the time, because of customer behavior, sometimes network, so there is some element of things going wrong in a mobile app happening all the time. What you want to know is when it goes beyond that level of threshold, you want to act. And that's where this comes in. This is a Facebook algorithm on called Profit, which is probably the first time we have used it in banking for time series to help us. Right? It's been very successful from helping us predict when things will go wrong so that we don't wait for 1,000 people to call our call center and we know, oh, the app is done. We use this to know upfront what we can do or when things are starting to get out of spend. Oh, this you can't see, but this is the fancy graph, uh, you know, of where each customer, this is each point is a customer. Each dot is a customer. These are all all the various stages you can go on our app. And it's just telling you where are customers going, which which what do they do first, where do they go next. What this helps us do is understand what's the golden path for our customer. And how do we get them to that golden path rather than uh, this is again most of the stuff that I've been talking about is more relevant to the consumer bank side because large customer bases. But when you think of our institutional business, less customers but more transactions per customer. So one of the areas that we looked at really is uh, on the institutional customers, what's important is the relationship between customers. What's important is how well are they connected? Who is your supplier? Who is, who, who are, what relationship do you have? Who do you supply? Who are the subsidiaries so that you can work with them? So one of the things we've been doing is really using a network graphing to connect who are you connected with. What that helps us do is many things. First, it helps us understand in your network, if you have a strong player, then we know that you have an anchor player. So in Singapore, let's say Singh Health is an anchor player for us because we have a strong relationship with Singh Health. But there are lots of subsidiaries or partners of Singh Health which are not customers of DBS. But there is a lot of transactions that are happening between them. So that gives us an opportunity to say, we can acquire these guys if we go with a value proposition. That's one area. Second, let's say another area, use case is, you know, a few years back we had some issues with uh, Swiber and some of that. Oil and gas companies started to take a hit when oil prices fell. So what this graph tells us, if we know that one oil and gas company is, is under pressure, we can know who all are they connected with, both upstream and downstream, so that we need to watch. So we need to preempt that, and we need to be ahead of the curve. Don't just watch it when they are already defaulting. 
How can we work with them even before they default through this network? So this is a multi-use, really building on this whole relationship to say how do we kind of leverage this way of looking at it and graphing to kind of move forward and build relationships. So just before we get, what I want to give you a sense of is right, at DBS, we are really focused on end-to-end -end and quite a variety across all our businesses of using digital and data. And that's why the variety of work that we do is very big. It's not just, oh, only marketing, we are using analytics. We are using analytics across such a wide range. And that's what, hopefully, this gives you a flavor of all the different areas that we are leveraging analytics. And we are seeing value. You know, it's not, we won't be doing it because if we didn't see value. So I'll, I'll shift here and, uh, and talk about my other two lenses, really. And one of the other things we are focused on is really how do we how do we help and enable people to use data more, and that's that's a structural challenge because we have 50 years of legacy to to change. Uh, so democratize data, make more data accessible to more people with obviously the right controls. Right? You can't you can't have a Facebook like incident in a bank. We will be shut down. Facebook just stock price dropped by 7%, that's nothing. It bounced back. Yeah. A bank will be shut down. So, you know, that, that it's not an even playing field. And how do we kind of manage that? Uh, governance and maturity, and how do we kind of balance between governance and giving access? We are very much governance focused, but how do we do that? A lot of discoverability metadata, so things which we need to put in, these are long haul things that we need to do using cloud again. But why do we want to invest in this is really to reduce our time to data and time to value. So how do we help do that and that's one big piece of uh, what the focus of our is. The last pillar in the data first program is really our infrastructure. So typically we had and this is a story for most banks. Uh, I mean, DBS has been very forefront in investing, so we are still lesser, but multiple data marts, multiple data warehouse, so we're moving to a unified data platform. Uh, our ability to handle variety of data. So our data warehouses are very good at structured data. But we are getting video feed, we are getting call transcripts, we are getting speech, speech uh, recordings, we are getting a lot of other kinds of data which traditionally have not got log files, so really being able to address that variety that they're getting. Uh, access, how do we make it more accessible, how do we make the data more discoverable, so this is a lot of, this is why we are investing in a modern data lake, which has all these features and capabilities, which help us overcome some of these challenges that we have with our existing platforms. And that's one of our, and it's, it's a multi-year program to build this, plus also irrigate because all the data is going into a traditional and how do you repipe it into it. Uh, digital native companies have it a lot easier because they start with no legacy. They, they have a white piece of paper that they start. So it's a lot easier to build it. But that's one of the challenges. Also it's one of our the opportunities for a bank. The opportunity and that's where a lot of interesting work goes in to try and solve these issues and do it in a manner that's that's efficient. So what is, uh, this is my last page is where I open up for questions. So what does success look like for us? And this is really, so for us, as, as a chief analytic officer for me, right, I, to me success is when everyone in DBS, when they are doing an innovation for the customer, they're using data. It's not just gut feel. Gut feel enhanced by data. When you are looking at improving the customer experience, don't just go anecdotal. <coughs> how are we using data to differentiate and make our customer experience? And how are we, how are we doing it? And then also day to day. Every day there are people who are making decisions. Most times all of us make decisions on that. Maybe in the back of our mind there is a processing going on which we are not aware of of that. But most so how do we be more how does each and every person in TBS 
consider the data that they have when they make a decision. So it's really about this relentless use of data across all of these. That's what, to me, success for me and DBS to be a data first organization. And that's what we strive to do. So comes to, an, to the end of what I was going to talk about. Hopefully you found it interesting. Hopefully you've got stuff on the wide variety of things that we're doing at DBS. Now I'm happy to take questions. Really, any question goes, so please, related to this or anything else, please. <coughs> uh, a couple of questions, actually. It's okay. Uh, first one is, uh, if you could say a bit more about uh, the underserved segments. You've got 480 variables, and I'm sure you've got a secret source, but can you give us a bit more detail on how, how those uh, underserved are, are uh, <coughs> scored for credit worthiness? That's really, there is a reason why it wasn't going into detail, right? But let me give you a flavor around it. So what we found is, when you look at credit uh, worthiness, right, you're looking at a few things. You're looking at stability of that individual. You are looking at a certain income profile of that individual. And you're looking at a verification of that individual, right? Now, when you break it down into verification, and you can say, what are the other non-traditional data that I can use to verify that the individual is who they say they are? That the individual stays in the place they say they are? So if you think about it, and you're partnering with people like e-commerce players, telecom players, and others, there are things that you can do. On the income side, you again, based on partnership with some of these players, people have based Income is a big demographic of the basket of goods that you buy, whether it's on the mobile side or whether it's on the e-commerce side. So you can estimate or you can predict or you can do people like you. And it will be a it will be a probabilistic range, but you can get to that. So that's the second thing. Third element is about stability, which is really around which is which is really around, you know, how how set your pattern is. How set is, a pattern could be as simple as uh, your location pattern or a commute pattern being the same. Uh, your uh, transaction pattern being the set. So it, it's really trying to get to that stability. So there is not, I won't go into the variables, but it's these three things that we are trying to solve for. And then a lot of other things fall into place because they help us think of this better. Okay, thanks. That's very interesting. So really you are, and you are in the ecosystem of those data providers as well. So the success of DBS is linked to, to the quality of the data That's right. and who you, who you actually partner who, who with. Who we work with, who we partner with, how do we do that? So one of the questions was just on the uh, enabling data usage. Data is always locked down and very hard to get hold of. It's just taken me six months sometimes to not get data. Yes. How have you enabled that? Again, um, back, you know, you so it, we are still in the process of enabling. I yeah. still have daily fights on that, <laughs> to be really honest, right? Yeah. But that's one thing we really need to remove friction from DBS. And that's something we're really looking and striving hard to do that. So a few things we are working on is, so if you break it down into, part of the problem is that data is not discoverable. Why is data not discoverable? Because in the past, we didn't put in the right metadata effort and metadata tools. So we are doing a lot of work to make metadata and the data discoverable. So we will make, within DBS, 100% of the people can go look up metadata to see what data is there. Metadata is no, there's no secret yeah. in metadata. Everyone should have access to it. But So first, we have to do a lot of work to get metadata. But that's the kind of thing that we are doing. Second is, we want to move away and start doing role-based access. If you're a certain role, here is the access. Okay. So, but that's again things that we are, it's, it's not going to happen overnight. We have legacy systems that need to change. So as we move data into a new platform, that's where we're building all this capability. We have data classification. Classification. We have data classification to a very nth degree, and then how do you use it? How do you make it available? Uh, right now, what we do is, why it takes so long is we, what we do is, anytime you ask for a data, so let's say you ask for data which is 10 fields. You ask for data which is 12 fields. You are allowed to have classified data, you're not allowed to have classified data. 
So, because we have no other way to control it, we will create a physical data mart for you, which is 10 fields, even though 8 of those 10 and 12 fields are common. And we'll create a separate physical data mart for 12 fields for you with, with you know, encrypting or, you know, making, uh, uh, hiding some of the other fields. Very inefficient process and very long. So now we want to move away from this physical to on read. Based on your access, the data is all the same. You want 10, 10 pieces of data. You have access to sensitive data. You can see all of it. You don't have access to sensitive data. So what you will get your 12 fields, but two of those fields will be encrypted. So, but don't do it at with physical, which takes long time. Do it on a virtual basis. But it's a we can't do it retrofitting into our data warehouses. So we are that's the capability we are building into our data lake. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so when we talk about so much digitization and DDS, I'm sure that involves a lot of fraud and risk as well. So how does uh, DBS happen? Like, do, we also, do we also do a lot of fraud analytics? Oh, very big. Uh, but it's I, common with banks. Very big. So fraud analytics <coughs> is very, very significant for us. So we do fraud analytics on multiple levels. So we do um, anti-money laundering fraud. We do KYC customer. And a lot of it is analytics too. A lot of it is. We are also looking at surveillance. So we do a lot of surveillance on uh, cyber security threats to us. We also do a lot of surveillance on our on our people, on our customers. We do a lot of analytics on our transactions. Every transaction goes through, okay, here are suspicious transactions, and therefore you need to monitor it. So there's a significant amount of analytics usage in that space that we do. And we see a big opportunity. We're just scratching the surface there. Yeah, so uh, I myself in have an analytics background. So, uh, so recent, you know, five years, we see the emergence of deep learning and artificial intelligence. That in a traditional organization, that people learn uh, analytics using the SaaS, you know, those traditional tools. Now, the Python is machine learning. So, how do you, you know, we have a bunch of people, you know, having the traditional skill sets and new PhD coming in with the new skill set. How do you mix them together, make a synergy? Uh, it's a great question, and that's something we are trying to do, which is, you need both sets of people, right? People who have been working in banking on the SaaS side, they have deep domain expertise. Uh, and then you bring in fresh blood, which have deep understanding of some of the new things. We, the way we do it is that we, we pair up people together. They work on a problem with the business people and say, how do we solve it? And what is the way to solve that? We are also very keen and we are investing a lot in upskilling all our people. So all our analysts, we are looking to say, if you have the aptitude to become a data scientist and want to learn. So we have tied up with, uh, with Coursera, we are doing with AI Singapore, creating a lot of opportunity and investing a lot to say, based on the individual, if you are in a SaaS program, at least your basics of programming is there. Okay, you might not know Python, but you can pick it up. You might not know Spark, but you can pick it up. At least you know the analysis part of it. So we are investing a lot in terms of self-help and capability and self-training capability that you can, you have the ability to do it. Over the next year, we are actually going to create a program of our internal people, both developers and analysts, to say we are going to get 20 or 40 of them and really those who are really keen to become data scientists and run through a full year program. Our, our goal is, like I said, one of the aims of us is a learning organization. So we are very committed to helping our teams learn. And we are at the same time, for us, uh, mixture, it's not either or. It's together. The analysts which have domain expertise plus the data scientists who have new techniques, it's together that will make the difference. So that's that's a few things. But it's, a, it's not easy because the people feel threatened, people feel, you know, it's, it's kind of, you have to make it work together. So are they, are they on citizen the different department or do they have the same team working together? Uh, both. So we, we do have, uh, within these teams, uh, so like for Consumer Bank in Singapore, they have a large analyst team, but they also have a small data sense. Team. So it's all co-located. So it's not so much within the teams, but it's when we solve a problem, the way we solve it is we create a squad. 
That is a cross-functional squad where people come in together and then they work together. So it doesn't matter which team they belong. It's they're working together in, to, in the next three months, six months to solve that problem. And they bring different roles, responsibility into the squad. How far are you on the data course program and how, what is the expectation? How far, it's, it's a very tough question. How far am I? I, I, I always say it's a journey that never ends. <laughs> I don't think there's an end to the data journey. So let me give you, Google when it came in, 98, now I'm telling my age, right? it, it was not the first search engine. There was Alta Vista, there was uh, yeah, who was also before Google, but Google had the best algorithm when they came. Now, has Google stopped investing in that algorithm? Never. Every day they are investing in it because that's so. Data first journey is never going to be over because it, the, the good thing about data is you are always going to what you did six months ago is no longer not no longer going to be good enough. You have to do better. So therefore, data will help you do better. So it's a it's a constant firing to do that. So I, I consider that it's a start, long way to go. So I guess. Yeah, uh, my question is about data security. Uh, so traditionally, uh, the data customer data is usually available to a restricted set of people. <coughs> Analytics, you're exposing the data to a large set of people, then how do you still uh, manage to keep the data secure? So again, I, I mean, I, again, you break it up, right? A lot of the analytics is done by the analytics team. So if you look at what, and among the 23,000 people, we have 600 people who I would call analysts and data scientists. So they need the raw data access. But everyone else doesn't need raw data access. They need output from that raw data. So for us, we want to, that's how we are differentiated. So we are we are looking at raw data access to people who are, because if I give a raw data access to my product manager, neither would they have the tools, nor would they know what to do. It will be like, oh, jumbled up, what do I do? So, so the way we look at it is we then create curated data sets on top, which then people have access to. And they have access to based on their need and their security. So we are very conscious of the, of the raw data access not being inappropriate. How do you actually keep pace with the data? I mean, data keeps changing by the minute. So like today, if you have a set of data, you analyze it and you come up with some solutions or outcomes or predictions. But the next minute, you see that the data has changed. So how do you, how so, do you so, keep pace with that? So when you build a model, right? Uh, you will traditionally, I mean in the old world, right? You will typically say, okay, I have six, 12 months of data. I will build it. I'll build the model on 11 months and I will test it on out of time on the 12th month. But what you have to do with these models is now, more and more you have to build a feedback loop into the model. And that feedback loop, and right now what we are doing is we don't need to have models that need to adapt on a minute by minute basis. Which is some of the recommenders that Amazon has done. What we have is feedback loop built into it and we recalibrate the model on a monthly basis. So new data coming in, which which could be, you know, there could be change in trends, there could be change in patterns. How do we take that into account to really rerun and recalibrate the model? So it's a, while this new data, and there are two sets of new data. One is the data that you have used for the model. Two is some data which is wasn't there when you built the model. Which is, so then for that data, you'll probably do a rediscovery once or six months to say, okay, are there other ways to make the model more efficient? Uh, we do, we do. So for various products, I mean, I didn't talk about we attrition modeling, so we do look at, uh, so typically in a bank, what happens is people don't leave the close their account to leave the bank. So if you have a credit card user and you have a credit card, you don't call the bank and say, cancel my credit card. What you will do is you just reduce your activity till it becomes over a period of time very bad. So what's this is what's called silent attrition. The same thing happens in your bank account. Typically, you never close the bank account, you, you reduce the end. So it's a lot tougher problem to solve. But we, we do have models which are focused on 
all our products on trying to get to this thing called sanitary nutrition. Um, actually, uh, we stories include uh, establishing different countries. So if you see India, the customer needs will be different and in Singapore it will be different. Sure. So how do you address the problems like the issues? So every country we look at the customer differently. So we really focus on a country specific customer by customer and segment by segment and say what are the needs. So the India Digital Bank that we launched was very different to the Indonesia. Even though at the back end 70-80% is the same. But the the front end and the customer interaction and the customer, this thing is very customized to the country. So that's how. Yeah. So uh, do you think that over time uh, DPS will become overly dependent on the data, and if there's a fault in the data somewhere or the connection or from you know integrated from different parties, so those kinds of things will happen, right? So uh, do you not think that it could fail if uh, over a certain time the charge for failure? Yes. Uh, so the idea. Is so let me take it in not just DBS context. Data will become crit more and more critical for more and more decisions that companies have to look at across the world. Now, what we need to do, and which we are working with our regulators and internally, we need to put in processes that make sure that we have fairness, transparency, <coughs> ethics around data use. So we are building our own internal processes of regular checks, regular things happening so that we don't have this inherent, sometimes what's called the inherent bias of the data, taking into a decision process. So, so that right now, so there is no, there's no regulation that kind of defines it. But we are actually working with MAS on, uh, on something called the FEAT, Fairness, Ethics, Accountability, Transparency Guidelines which we will incorporate it so that our models go through a retraining process, our models go through and a fair, fairness assessment, our models go through and our data usage goes through ethical data usage. So it's not just legally we are allowed to use the data, but ethically are we, is it okay or not? That, so those are things we are putting in processes in place to really preempt that from happening. So I have a question. So sure. uh, are there any uh, cases that you could tell us about where uh, you learned about it a little too late. Uh, you were not able to pay until. Uh, lots of cases, I just don't think I can tell you about them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it happens, so that's a call center. Uh, a lot of times what happens, we had a big, uh, so we acquired the ANZ, a customer base in Singapore. And, and as part of the acquisition, you had to port all the ANZ customers from there uh, banking system to DBS banking system. And when we were doing that, we tested it to death, but there something failed when the actual thing happened and there was some gyro failure. So customers who had set up the gyros, it did not work. And, but we could predict, customers started calling our call centers only when we got inundated with it that we called that we said, oh, let's go understand that. So th those kind of things happen. Even if you put a prediction in everything, you're not going to predict everything. Your goal is to be able to preempt as much as possible the big items. The effort to preempt those items which are very small is very difficult because an event that happens once a year is impossible to predict. Right? So, so it, and the effort is just, I mean, it's impossible to predict. There's no model in the world that can pre predict an event, once a year event. So, that, that's where it's a judgment on how much effort you put in and trying to predict and what's the value of it. I've got a question on proxy credit scoring. Uh, which is the one where you use external data to do credit scoring to customers in India, uh, for example. Uh, one of the questions I have is that for this proxy credit scoring, what is the most important process? So I would assume it is identity verification, so you could have identity fraud. Because uh, all three are very important. If you look at so if you look at things, people like Sesame Credit in China, uh, which is Alibaba's credit score, they do all three. And you can't say which is more important. It's the combination which is the most important. Ah, okay. So there's no secret sauce in one of these specific areas? The there are many secret sauces, but in all three areas is what I would say. All three are equally important. Because it's not a, it's not so binary. I understand. 
the follow question on that is uh, if you follow on, if you take action on this credit score and extend credit on that, uh, how, does it, how does the bank think about the short time horizon, the data which they have on, on the loans uh, issue of this data? Now, how do they think about the uh, like sort of events for this? Like credit uh, we, that's part of, you know, we, when we start giving a loan for any portfolio, whether we do it through a credit bureau or credit processes that we have, or newer credit processes, we always do what's called stress testing. So we, we always start small. So when we start something like this, we start with a final. We start with a corpus of saying we give so many loans to up to so many million. And we will monitor performance so that even if it goes bust, we know that it's, it's a small part of it. It's a small part of it. So we're not going to go. We manage the risk across all our portfolios very tightly. So that's why it's a small scale that we look at. Only when we are comfortable that the credit history, credit variables, all of that is comfortable, then we can open up. But anytime, even today, when we are doing traditional credit underwriting, we still manage, we do stress testing on the book. Where we take into account, you know, oil prices going up to $150. Economy growth rate dropping to from 4% to 1% negative. Which are the stress tests that we do, which are your black swan. Now, does it take care of all black swan events? No. But those are the stress test points that we look at constantly to see how much stress we will have, if an event like that. So, thank you. In the digital transformation journey, uh, how, what, uh, my question is directed at what are the most significant challenges and what uh, were some of the unique solutions that you brought to the table that really truly unlocked um, you know, some of these uh, uh, solutions that we see uh, today? So some of the, to me, I, I think the biggest challenge is a cultural challenge. Biggest challenge is making, so people who have been in banking for 20, 30, 30, Banking for them means this. And you have to say, this plus data can add value. So there is a lot of skepticism. So you have to demonstrate that it can add value, it works, it Im gives impact. And, and a lot of times, even if you get people excited, because there is all this hype about big data that suddenly it will, it will solve world hunger. The world is hungry not because there is not enough food. Right? I mean, there's enough food in the world that's produced. It's just half of it is wasted. So it's it's trying to balance that yes, value data can help you, digital can help you, at the same time managing the hype. Because everyone globally is talking about oh big data, this, that. Every two years they move to a new cycle of something new and then creates hype. And then helping take one area and then demonstrate working with them that there is impact. Because as a business guy, People are focused on if it can make my life easier, if it can give, give me value, if it can make my customers better, that's what people do. All leaders want that. So how do you demonstrate that it can do it? And how do you get, get the investment and the patience to be able to take them through? It's not like switch on, switch off, right? So that's been, it's more a cultural challenge. Once you overcome that mindset, then everyone gets on to it, gets saying, I want to do this, I want to do that. Now, for me, the bigger thing is, how do I prioritize? I only have so many people. I can't do everything that everybody wants me to do. So, so, so in your case, how did you overcome that uh, mindset? Was there a hard moment that you brought to the table that got everybody so to what, in? Or? So what we did is we, we, among our leadership team, we picked a few who were, who were more open who were more supportive in the beginning. So the early adopters. So we picked a couple of them and we went very deep with them to create, to show outcomes and create success stories. Once we created them, then they became our ambassadors. Once they started talking about it and then our CEO started talking about it and recognizing those guys for doing it, then everybody wants to be recognized for it. Right? So it's, it's really taking these and taking these early adopters and making heroes. Both demonstrate the outcome for them, demonstrate the value to them, and make them heroes. That kind of led to a swell. Hmm. 
Hi, Samir. For India and Indonesia, um, microfinance has a presence there, right? more yes. so in Singapore. Uh, my background is not in banking, but I would know, uh, I'm guessing that DBS would be different from your Grameens or your, or your Brex. Uh, but now with this DigiBank with probably lower cost for penetration, so can you offer the same services as microfinance to the underserved? Um, maybe not the same, but eventually you, if you look at, uh, there are two things which define money. One is the small ticket size, mm -hmm. and, and, and there is obviously as a bank, with digital, we can lower the traditional ticket size that we have. But can we go down to a very right. small daily collection mm -hmm. problem? Right. So it's, it's going to be somewhere between the sphere that we will play in. Okay. We kind of figure out what our sweet spot is. Okay, so it's still not exactly the same, but coming down to a lower level. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, my question is around the previous takeover of the ANZ product. So uh, last year, like, uh, the takeover was happening across multiple countries. So I want to know how data analytics played a role in the uh, end user part. Because as an end user, I don't, uh, we do not prefer changes. We don't even prefer if there is a change in the interface of an app. So how did data analytics play a role in this? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Data analytics did not play much of a role in that. <laughs> This is a regulatory. When you take over a business, you have to. There is no. There is. You have to transfer the entire business and the entire core system from one to the other. So there's no. We had no option to say that you could continue having that ANZ interface because that had to be switched on. So so we had no choice but to do it. Now where analytics played a part is really a lot of deep communication based on propensity, based on other things to say, okay, do I over communicate with you because you are more anxious? I'm okay to communicate less, maybe just one. That, and really have constant communication based on, we send communication, who read it, who went to some of the files, and then we communicate more. So analytics played more a part in the engagement part of it, rather than on you know, the transfer of that. Sorry, that's the question again. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you rolled out Banking for India, Indonesia. Taiwan is coming up soon. Okay. Singapore. Right. Singapore, yes. I mean, to me, all this, if you look at our app, it's called Digi. So, all these capabilities that we have rolled out, now in Singapore, our focus is less on acquiring customers. 85% of Singaporeans are in the US. So, we, we, we are less. <laughs> We are less about acquiring customers, we are more about engagement with the customers. We are more about helping the transaction. So our app here is called Digiman. And we are investing much more here. It, but our focus is less on acquisition, more on transaction and engagement. So for those like maybe the older generation but not on the backing app, so how do you track that data? Uh, so we well, app is not the only thing that we do, right? We um, we are very conscious of the fact that we are the main bank in, in Singapore. So we are very conscious of the fact that we have certain societal responsibilities of generation and segment. So we keep all our branches are very much focused on servicing and our POSP branch, especially within the neighborhoods and stuff. We, it's the old way. Anybody who walks into the branch typically walks in to do a transaction. So any transaction they do, whether it's digital or there, we, 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 we have data around that. So we, we, it's just that when you have a digital, probably you have more data. When you're non digital, you have less data, but you don't have data. Uh, I know it's very important to have a digital product, but it's also very difficult to change the mindset of the management team. But how can you change the mindset of the customers? Maybe someone has the like, traditional view of the apps, maybe they say it's insecure. So it's a it's a very interesting question. Again, uh, I, I think I would break it up into segments and demographics. I think anybody below 35, because they have grown up with this whole mindset of apps updating every month. So for them, when you update an app, it's not an issue. So I'll tell you a story. A few years ago, a couple of years ago, we, we had a a good app or 
but we wanted to really make our app much more user friendly, much more UX driven and all. But when we launched the app, there was so much feedback, oh I like the old app. Because people were used to doing it and it was largely coming from us. So we had to do a lot of education. So initially there is this, because I'm used to doing it the old way, even though the newer way now is faster, quicker, all of that is easier. But so we have to work with a lot of communication, a lot of engagement to overcome that. And there's no you know, magic bullet which people, some, some parts of the population take on to it very fast. Some parts will keep resisting and you have to work with them to show why is it, why is it faster, easier for them. Sometimes it's just habit. But if you can break that habit and educate them, it overcomes. Now, so typically this kind of stuff happens the first couple of months. After that, people get used to it, so they they are okay with it. But the newer generation, because app, you know, every game that we play, right? my son plays Fortnite. How many of you know Fortnite? Come on, nobody. There's no professor here. Nobody sees it. <laughs> so you know, Fortnite updates itself every few weeks. So they're quite used to it. They they, they put in a new isle, new part of the island. They put in something else. We we don't even think about it. So where do you see DBS's uh, tech arm being in 10 years? Will you contribute to the about the revenue? So DBS is tech arm. The way we think of DBS, in DBS, the way we think of it is, is something that tech is business, business is tech. Okay. We are, tech is, is just so integrated into the business that it's part of the business. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how we see it. Business and tech are, are the only way to really work, and this is business and tech, really can be It's not whether tech arm is separate or the business arm is separate. Now that's a big change. Typically in the old days, the business leads used to be there, and then there'd be, tech would be a support team at the back of this. But DBS, that's the other big transformation we're driving is really, tech is business, business is tech, and they need to work. So joint KPIs. Tech and business have joint KPIs on both technology area and outcomes. So not like being done where you go and reach out to other segments, such as doctor and all this. DBS will not try to do it. Uh, well, we are in some sense doing it with our ecosystems. So like we have in, in Singapore, we have a car marketplace, we are looking at a travel marketplace. Selectively, we are looking at experiments around that to see where it, where it. But to us, the big thing is where does it benefit our customers? Hi, to explain this question, uh, do you think analytics will control at five years or in ten years time? Control, plateau, plateau. The hype will definitely plateau, and hopefully, when the hype plateaus, the real world will start. It's the hype that kills you. Hype that suddenly analytics can do everything and pinpoint everything. I mean, analytics is playing with probabilities. You know, a any model that you build is a probabilistic model. Yeah. Probability means, okay, yeah, you flip the coin, it's 0.5% probability that it will turn head, or 50%, right? So, you want to use models to get to 70%, but there's no such thing as 99 or 100% probability, then it's a certain. So, after the innovation is over, do you think that there will be more maintenance of the model system? Yes. And there will be more, you know, using models to solve problems will become a lot more than right, right now. That's what we are trying to do in DBS. We are trying to say it's not so much focused on the model you build, it's focused on the problem you have. A lot of other companies are really focused on the fancy model. Well, what, to me, if a simple model can solve the problem faster, quicker, cheaper, why do I need a fancy model? Because I'm not focused on the model. I'm focused on the outcome that I'm looking to drive. The outcome at the least effort. That's what I'm focused on. Highest, best outcome, least effort. That's my trade-off. So, I don't see analytics, you know, I think the hype for analytics will be up. But the analytics work, more and more data will come in. The more you improve, the more harder it will become to improve. But then, therefore, you need even more smarter people to improve and more data will be. Because you, standing still is not an option. You have to constantly improve. So you are saying that the, the bigger companies will get even more data and even improve further 
Uh, that, that, that's one potential that could be there. You look at all the platform companies, right? Whether it's in the US or whether it's so anybody who's above 500 billion right now. They're all platform companies. There's Google, there is Apple, there is Amazon, there is Tencent, there is uh, Alibaba. What do they have in common? Really, if you think principally, what do they have in common? It's a bedrock of data and customers. Now, even Facebook for the matter, maybe it's not no more, no longer 500 billion, it's come down a little. Poor Zuckerberg has become poor guy now. <laughs> but that, that, that's the, that is the reality that we have. So in one of the slides, you spoke about three times deeper customer engagement. So I understand like the frequency of that, but how do you essentially gauge what, how the... See, eventually the deeper customer engagement that we do is we eventually break it down into, uh, has the average revenue per customer. So, so there are multiple ways, we have lots of things, but eventually as a business outcome metric, mm -hmm. we are looking at the more engaged the customer is, the more transactions they will do with us, the more transactions they will do with us, the more products they will hold with us, the more products they hold with us, the more revenue we get. So that's kind of our path around engagement. So we look at, you know, your daily transactions, your, your uh, product holdings, your all of that across the world. But that's how we How are we doing on time? Five minutes. So one, one probably question. one last question, and then. I could ask one more. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, what, are you doing anything specific to onboard the aging population? Because that's a huge chunk, right? So we are. What we have in a lot of our uh, POSP neighborhood branches, we have uh, we have putting people who are slightly older who are basically, we are, the idea is for them to help educate. Make, make, the, make the older generation more comfortable, whether it's about using ATM or whether it's about, so we do a lot of app education. We have iPads in these places where we say, okay, this is what you can do, this is how you do it. It's more around this whole education space to make them, once you, they get used to it, it's easier, but just the education, so that's what we are focused on. Anything on the interface aspect? Not so much because all our interfaces are really built with a very, uh, with very very customer centric and user centric. So we, we spend a lot of time in doing customer testing, usability testing with various segments of customers. I think I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that the session has been very interesting. Thank you very much. Right, for I Thank you. Our appreciation. Thank you, guys. It's been and a, I think it's great to have questions. Yeah. The next session is going to be in about two weeks. We look forward to seeing you in another session.